So, we have been uh, looking at the purpose of the book of Mark, and we have done the historical purpose and the uh, doctrinal purpose, what doctrines are being taught here in the book of Mark. And so, now we come to the section that is about Jesus Christ. How does this book relate to Jesus? And we have here a picture of Jesus. Of course, this is a biography, so it's very easy to come along and relate this book to Jesus because it is about him. But Mark presents Jesus as the Son of God, as he does so in the very first verse. He presents him as the Son of Man. Uh, so, in other words, born of uh, born like us in the sense that he is man even though he is different to us and that he had no earthly father but he is man he is not part man and part god he is fully man and fully god and that's what we need to remember but he also presents mark also presents jesus as the servant of god in order to give his life for mankind. Matthew presented Jesus as the king of the Jews. It's not that Mark denies that. But Mark comes along and, and shows Jesus as a servant. Serving others. Giving us the example of how we are to serve others. And the most significant way, of course, that he served mankind is by dying on the cross for our sins, shedding his blood in order to bring about the new covenant. So I'm not rushing through this section in a sense because it is important, but everything in this book is about Jesus. And so, uh, uh, so we, the reason why we went through it a, a little fast is because we're seeing these in other sections. So that is... The, that ends the section on the purpose of Mark. And now we enter into the content. What actually do we read? And so that will give us an opportunity to actually get into the book and to read some passages so that we become, at least on this overview, more familiar with the, the types of things that Mark talks about. And of course, the first thing that we're going to deal with is actually some of the last things that Mark records in this book. We're going to start with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because Mark presents this in detail, just like Matthew did. When we discussed Matthew, we discussed that Jesus predicted his death three times. Mark gives us that prediction again, those three predictions. And so we're not going to look at those what we are going to look at is some differences or things we didn't look at in our study of Matthew. So if you go to Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, we're going to read verses 1 and 2, and we'll get Gord to do that for us. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Uh, sorry, Mark 14. Uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, I'm, I don't know why I said Matthew. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. After two days it was the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, is there be an uproar of the people. All right. So if you want to know why we can come along and say, Jesus taught uh, on, uh, we can pinpoint the days that Jesus taught in that week. We can know he cleansed the temple on Monday uh, because the book of Mark makes it clear 
that Jesus cleansed the temple on Monday. Most of his teachings were on Tuesday. We don't have uh, records really of Wednesday unless what we just read here is Wednesday. But Mark tells us after two days it was the Passover, which is also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's important we remember that these two festivals, these two feasts occurred at the same time. The Feast of Passover was first on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, lasted one day. The Passover lambs were killed at the end of that day. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread began immediately after that, and that lasted seven days. There was a holy convocation, worship of the Lord, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And there was a holy convocation on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because the Passover followed a date rather than a day, Passover moves around. It not only moves around, if you take a look at our calendars, from late March to early April, because a Jewish calendar is done by the moon and not the sun. It also moves around on which day of the week it, it happens on. Most people will celebrate Easter, and most, most people who profess to be Christians, we don't. We remember Jesus' sacrifice on the first day of every week. But it always... Uh, Good Friday and Easter always occur on the same day, on the same, not the same date, but Friday and Sunday. <laughs> Jewish Passover could take place on any day. It could take place on Sunday, it could take place on Tuesday. And so, and so whatever day of the week this was, which we do know is Friday here, but whatever day of the week it was doesn't tell us necessarily what day it is. We, the only reason why we know that this is Friday is because Jesus rose on Sunday. Mark's going to make that clear in, in um, Mark chapter 16. That Jesus rose on Sunday. That was the third day. So the Passover was on Friday. Jesus would have had the Last Supper on thir what we would call Thursday evening. What he, they would call Friday evening because their days begin at, uh, at um, sunset and not sunrise. John, you're either here or there. That's Annie. That's supposed to be Annette. So you're not far enough in that chair. You can be there or you can be in the back. Uh, paper there, uh, just so you know. Um, all right. So we understand that all right this is the feast of passover what else do we get from those two verses about uh about what we're going to be dealing with with the death burial and resurrection of jesus it was a conspiracy to try and take jesus okay there was a conspiracy that's a good word uh it is they were, well conspiring yeah like how we use conspiracy yeah. these days but they well were conspiring to take him yeah Actually, that's still, we still can use that word that way. When you think about criminal courts, when we talk about a conspiracy, sometimes you see a conspiracy to commit murder. It's a group plan. It's not one person deciding to kill someone else. That would be murder. And you would not be tried for conspiracy to commit murder because it's just one person. However, if Christina and I and David and Gord all got together and we said, we don't like so-and-so, we're going to kill them. Now, hopefully as Christians we would not do that. But if we, uh, if we did, that's a conspiracy. Well, the scribes, chief priests, and rulers were supposed to be the religious people. That's why I used us as an example. They were supposed to be the religious people. And yet here they were, conspiring to kill someone. Now, what, when did they want to do this? When did they want to do this, according to verse 2? After the feast. Yeah, after the feast. However, however, you can come along and say, well, but they did it 
during the feast, in, like as far as when you take a look. But they didn't have Judas yet. We'll get to him in a second. An opportunity presented itself, and they took it. Um, why didn't they want to kill Jesus during the feast? They thought there'd be a riot. Jesus was a popular teacher. And that's the reason why they arrested him when they did. Because if they did it in public, in the temple, they would risk people rioting and getting the Romans involved, and, and then Jesus wouldn't be able to be killed. In fact, they would get them in trouble, could wind up getting them killed by the Romans for starting a riot. Plus, when it comes to their influence, if it is seen that the chief priests and the scribes are the ones who plotted against him, uh, plot, made this plot, that could also hurt them uh, as far as their reputation. Now, when you think about it, the reputation, Jesus was, uh, Jesus was um, speaking against them all week and ruining their reputation because he was teaching the people about the hypocrisy. But they didn't want Jesus to teach anymore. They had had enough. And so that's the beginning. We have the plot. But they don't have the means yet. Jesus is, it's not like Jesus is staying in a public hotel that they could come and just take him. He's staying among friends. Uh, he is in verses 3 through 9 which we won't read here, we find he's staying with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Do you think Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, if they can help it, are going to hand Jesus over to these, to these uh, bands of warriors? I see a lot of people shaking their heads no. No, they're not going, and they're not going to try because, of course, Jesus is around people that he loves. So they got a problem. How are we going to arrest Jesus? If we do it in the temple, there's going to be a riot. We don't really know where he is. He's not staying out in public, not in the streets. Then something presents itself. Let's read verses 10 and 11 of chapter 14. We'll get to Cala. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money, and he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. All right. Uh, we have Judas. Judas, one of the twelve. How surprising, in a sense, this is that we have, that we have um, Judas here except for the fact that this was prophesied in the book of Psalms, that Judas would betray, uh, would be the one who betrayed. If we go to uh, Psalms 41, we'll go to David. Psalms 41, verse 9, and Christina can get Psalms 55, verses 12 to 14. Psalms 41, verse 9. Now, again, doesn't sound like much of a messianic psalm, but it is applied here to Judas. James, I think you're back here. Uh, that was supposed to be for Annette, and that's too close to others. So you're, yeah, there's a chair back there. That goes along with uh, when Jesus said the one who dips his hand. Yeah. With him will betray him. Yeah, let's go to Psalms, yeah. Exactly right. Let's go to Psalms 55, verses 12 to 14. And that's Christina. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, and my familiar friend. He who had sweet fellowship together walked in the house of God in the throng. All right. So,
combining Psalms 41 and Psalms 55 the way the scriptures do uh, in other places, in Acts chapter 1 especially. Uh, we have Jesus, be, uh, Judas being described as a friend of Jesus. And it's going, what Gord had said, Jesus had prophesied when he was, um, when he was uh, eating the, the Last Supper with the disciples, whoever dips uh, his, uh, the sop in here with, with me will betray me. The other disciples didn't know what that meant. They, they didn't understand because really, why would they why would they understand if it was among the 12? It's sort of like someone in this room betraying me. I'm not expecting that. If it was prophesied that that would happen, I'd have a hard time believing it. Even though Jesus was the one who said it, it's hard to, it's hard to believe that someone would come along, he'd been with Jesus for three years, and yet he would betray him. We're going to find in the book of John when we get there one of the reasons why Judas betrayed him. So we're going to save that reason until we get to John. But the thing we have to realize is it was prophesied in Scripture that Judas would betray him. That's why Judas was selected. Jesus knew the men he was selecting. He knew their hearts. He knew their zeal. Judas wasn't a completely evil man. Let's not come along and think that Jesus selected purely evil men. But even good people do bad things, and sin gets in the way of people doing, uh, of people doing um, uh, bad things. In other words, sin does get in the way. We must take heed lest we fall. Let's not come along and say, I will never do that. Peter will say, he would never deny Jesus. We're about to get to that. And so we, we have Judas here. We didn't cover that. Judas was the one who was going to betray him. And so Judas went to the chief priests. And in our study of Luke, we're going to find why Judas knew where Jesus was going to be. Why did Judas know that? Well, Luke's going to tell us it's because Jesus went there every night. Judas went to the Garden of Gethsemane every night for the week he was there to pray and to meditate and to teach his disciples. Judas knew where Jesus was going to be. Jesus was setting up Judas to do the things that Jesus knew Judas would do. And so... He came to the chief priest, an opportunity presented itself, and the chief priest took it. Who better to give Jesus to them, one of his disciples, they're doing all the work for them. He's doing all the work for them. He can lead us right to him. He can do so away from the crowds. And Judas, Jesus doesn't, isn't surrounded by an army. He's got some fishermen disciples. He's got tax collectors. He doesn't have an army. We can certainly take him. And so we have Judas here. If you want to take a look at the Mount of Olives, last time we looked at, I think it was from the other side. Well, maybe, maybe it was the same side. But Mount of Olives would be up here. Oh, this is the entire mountain. Of course, they have cathedrals uh, up on that mountain as well. Garden of Gethsemane is on here. It would, it's not, you can't visibly see it, but... This is where Jesus was, was. It's one of the mountains outside of Jerusalem. And so, when it comes to where Jesus was, he was in the garden when he was arrested. You have something, James? Oh, okay. Looked like you had your hand up. And so Judas led the, the people here, and Jesus is arrested, taken for trial. Now, before Jesus was arrested, he had foretold not only would his disciples scatter, but Peter would deny him. So let's go get that. 
Well, let's skip ahead into chapter 14. We're going to get verses 66 to 72. Annie can get 66 and 67. John can get 68 and 69. Gord, 70, 71, and 72. Uh, so Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 66. John verse 68. If you're there, Mark 14, verse 68 and 69. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Uh, all right. Yeah, all right. So, Gord, can you get 68, 69, and then Cal can get 70, 71, and 72? But he denied it, saying, I neither know, know <clears throat> nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. Verse 70, Kala. Mm, again, he denied it, and after a while they standing there said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, but you, but you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. All right. So Mark presents this as one event. And it's very easy to read through this and, and go, okay, Peter, Peter denied Jesus. A couple minutes later, Peter denied Jesus again. And a couple minutes later, Peter denied Jesus again. Well, the book of John and the book of Luke is going to place this uh, uh, these denials into the story a little bit. You're going to realize that this happened over a couple of hours. This did not happen one right after the other. You're going to have him, Peter was following on behind, far away. In other words, he wasn't with the group that was arresting Jesus. He wasn't following close behind the soldiers. He didn't want to be associated with Jesus. He was afraid he was going to be arrested. He came, and he was outside in the courtyard of the high priest, warming his hands. Remember, this is early spring. So when it's, it's in the middle of the night. We know if you were out last night after dark, it got pretty cold. Well, it it's might not be minus 13 like it was here last night, or at least it felt like it last night, but it could be around freezing. And it's not like these guys were just sitting there expecting to be out in the middle of the night. And so they had a fire warm in their hands. Who came along? Who came along? In verse 66. No, no, Peter, but who came along with Peter? All right, so we had a servant girl of the high priest. It wasn't, it wasn't a, what we would call a big wig. It was just a servant girl. She came along and they said, Oh, you are with Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we might ask, well, where did this servant girl know that? Remember, they had been in the temple all week. They had been, like as far as Peter... Uh, like he, he might not be recognizable by face when you were in a big crowd, but he had obviously, Peter is usually the ones standing up by Jesus, usually the closest ones to Jesus. And so when you associate, okay, Jesus is over there, and now we got this guy over here. He's Jesus. He's with Jesus. He says, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. Okay, and we had the rooster crow. Still night, 
the rooster will crow before sunrise. Uh, it, it is still it is still night, and we have the rooster crowing once. Peter denied Jesus once. All right, sixty nine comes along, and the servant girl saw him again, and began to stay. Who those this time? The first time she asked Peter. This time she started asking the crowd or telling the crowd. This guy was with Jesus. He was with Jesus. And this time, Peter had to deny it much more forcefully because he didn't want that crowd to go be telling the chief priests that he was there. James. You know, um, we're looking at Peter's situation here. You know? um, Peter denied Christ. Um, if we're faced with situations, and uh, I think this, this is there to show us that anybody can mm -hmm. fall. Yes. But if we face situations that we're going to be persecuted, all right, will we really stand up and say, I believe in Christ? Yeah. You know, you know Peter faced this, and you see um, what happened and how he reacted after. Mm -hmm. But um, if we face a situation similarly, will we deny Christ? Yeah. Well, that's a good point to make, and one I was going to get to in a second, but you brought it up, so we'll get to it now. We, we think that we're strong. I would never do that. Well, if a gunman walked through that door and said, do you believe in Jesus? If you say yes, I will shoot you. And that has happened. I'm not pulling that out of thin hair. That, that happened in the United States. Would you deny Jesus to save your life? He said he wouldn't deny Jesus, and yet he did. I would hope we would not deny Jesus to save our lives. However, it's always easy to say that when you're not faced with the situation. It is easy to say that. It is easy to say that when you are not faced with a life and death call. I hope we would make the right call. If we don't make the right call, can we be forgiven? Yes, we can, but it will require repentance. And it will require us to really understand what we've done. Peter is going to hear, go here and he's going to weep bitterly. And it's going to take Jesus really leaning into Peter to get Peter to... Recognize that God forgave him and that he needs to move on. What's done is done. He cannot fix that anymore as far as he can't go back and undo it. He did what he did. He repented. God forgave him. Now was time to move on. We need to do that too. We cannot undo some of the sins we've committed. Maybe some of the sins we committed are really bad. But has God forgiven you? If God has forgiven you, we should not dwell on that sin anymore. Use it to, to help us in the future? Yeah. Learn from it, but don't dwell on it. If God has forgiven it, it's forgiven. And Peter would move on to be the apostle that we read of in the book of Acts and even in his epistles. The last time, though, that Peter denied Jesus, he was, uh, it was because people heard him. Now, we have members of this congregation who are from different parts of the world, and they have different accents. Some are from Canada and the United States, but some are from China. Some are from Jamaica, some are from Europe and South America, and you can hear it when they speak, that they are from those places. Here, Peter had a Galilean accent. We often think, well, it was Israel. Well, go to Quebec and they're going to have a different accent than Newfoundland and Labrador, than even Alberta. 
you, just because you might be Canadian doesn't mean you all have the same accent even if you were born here. Well, Galileans had their own accents. Judeans had their own accents. And so we have this guy here in the crowd. Jesus is a Galilean, been arrested. Now, Peter, you're a Galilean. You must be with him. And Peter denied him a third time. And then Peter remembered. We say, well, why didn't Peter remember the first time or the second time? You're in the heat of the moment. We, he's wanting to preserve his life. Oftentimes, when we, when we are under stress, we don't think clearly. It's happened to me. It's happened to you. It's happened to everyone. We come along and we look back and say, how could I have been so stupid? How could I have been so blind? But it happens, unfortunately, that when we're put in a situation that we don't act the way we should. This here is a story for us, as James said. It should be a story to teach us that even the most ardent disciple of Jesus can fall. And that should humble us into thinking and to knowing that I can too. God doesn't want me to, but I can. But it also shows us that I can return. That's important as well for us to know that Yes, we might do something that is sinful. But do we repent? Do we ask God to forgive us? And if we do, if we are his children. God will forgive. And so that's an important lesson. Even before we get to the story of Jesus. We're going to save Pontius Pilate for the book of John. Because more of the story of Pontius Pilate it's found there. Now let's go to Mark chapter 15. And what I'd like us to do is deal with uh, the end of, uh, of Jesus' life. He's hanging on the cross. He has been convicted by Pontius Pilate. Barabbas has been exchanged. He has been flogged, he has been beaten, he has been mocked, he has hung on the cross now for six hours, and he calls out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We discussed that in Matthew, that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross, but I believe Jesus is teaching on the cross, go back to the book of Psalms, I think it's Psalms 22, uh, off the top of my head. Jesus quotes the first verse. The chief priests quote the middle. And at the end of that psalm, it's a psalm of deliverance. The Lord did not forsake the person who's made the statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in the book of Psalms? God heard and delivered. Well, Jesus was experiencing physical death, something he had never experienced before. He was in brutal pain. And so it could be easy to think, well, God forsook him. God did not. Let's go to, though, and read verses 37 to 39. We'll come back to James. James, can you get verse 37 and 38? David 39 and uh, or verse 39. Okay, so we have Jesus dying. 
The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. What we don't realize is the temple was a grand structure. The veil of the temple, you could not reach the top to tear it from the top. Once it was hung, you, you, you weren't going to get there. If you were going to tear the veil of the temple physically, you'd tear it from the bottom. And it's not just, a, it was not just this thin piece of tapestry either. It was a curtain. God tore it from the top to the bottom when Christ died, showing that the way to God, to the Holy of Holies, was now open to man because Christ died. In the Old Testament, the veil represented that separation. Only the high priest could go behind the veil and then only once a year. Now, God was saying, because Jesus died, shed his blood and paid the price for sin, now we have access. The book of Hebrews spends a lot of time talking about that. But when the centurion who stood opposite Jesus saw all the things that had happened, the sun darkened, the earthquake, saw everything, that convinced him. Jesus was the Son of God. Does that convince us? I hope it does. When we read about all the things that Jesus did, that Jesus is the Son of God. Lord, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to